So welcome everybody. Welcome back to the security stream of the uh, GSE conference. It's now 1.30 and uh, just before I hand you over to uh, Mark Nelson, who's our, our, our next presenter, um, just a couple of words. Uh, so this is uh, session 6 AI, so keep that in your back pocket for when we get to the end of the session when we need to do feedback. Uh, the QR code uh, for session feedback is at the bottom of your screen on Mark's presentation there, so use your QR reader to scan for that. Like I said in the previous session, feedback is very important for not only the presenter but also for GSE. Um, how we improve for you for next year, but also for if you want to get your CPD or CPE certificate with all the credits on, uh, then you need to uh, to provide feedback because that's how we construct the uh, the certificate. Um, and also, don't forget our charity as well. Um, I'm sure Mark will show the slide towards the end of his session, um, so that uh, yeah, hopefully you can uh, make a small whatever donation you can afford for that. So uh, let's say a big warm welcome and it gives me great pleasure to welcome back Mark Nelson who uh, has been, I forget how many years it has been now Mark, you've been coming to the, the, the conference um, and uh, Mark does some fantastic sessions for us and this is a brand new session I believe, is that right Mark? It is. Yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to listen to this, I mean Parallel Sysplex, it seems like decades ago it was introduced and uh, I kind of think it's one of these things we sometimes you know forget about and uh, but anyway I won't steal your thunder Mark um, welcome back to uh, welcome back to us and, uh, and over to you sir take the stage. Uh, thank you very much Jamie uh, good afternoon good morning wherever you are it's morning time here in Poughkeepsie uh, 4 a.m start time is a lot of fun I, I'm not a morning person but I, it, GSE is one of the few things I think it's worth getting up for that early love the sessions great content so far and again thank you for inviting me uh, to be a part of this it is just so much fun. I really wish we were in the UK together. I wish I was able to throw chocolate at everybody. I almost put some Halloween chocolate here and threw it, was going to throw it at the screen, but eh, not a good idea. So the session today is RACF and the parallel cisplex. And I, I just want to shape this a little bit. It's a RACFer's view of the parallel cisplex uh, because quite frankly, I, I'm the security guy. I love the RACF product. I love the products that use RACF. I love the whole RACF environment. I used to be a systems programmer prior to joining IBM. I've been in RACF now 32 years, IBM 38. But there was a point in time in my life where I was a, a systems programmer. And, and these are two different worlds. And sometimes these two different worlds talk two different ways. So this session is really meant to be a bridge between what RACF people look at and think about and what systems programmers might be looking at and thinking about. And the intersection of those two environments here is really this environment called the Sysplex environment. Uh, specifically, we want to focus on the parallel Sysplex and how RACF uses some of these Sysplex functions that have been made available to us. So the agenda is going to be those three parts. We're going to look at what RACF does in terms of managing its data in the RACF database. Then we're going to look at what the Sysplex is from just a very, very high level view. What technology does it bring? What function does it bring? And why is that function there? And then we'll see how RACF uses those technologies to do the things that it needs to do. So that's our roadmap. Uh, if you have questions, please post them in the chat and uh, Jamie will be monitoring. And if, uh, because I cannot see the chat where I am. And if a question comes up, he'll, uh, he'll find a place when I take a breath ask the question and on we go. So please, uh, questions make these sessions just so much more enjoyable. So let's spend a moment talking a little bit about the RACF database. So what is the RACF database? Well, it's the storage location. It's the place where RACF stores the vast majority of its operational and control information. It's where you put your security rules. Uh, it's, it's how RACF communicates it, 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 it's some of its information to other systems. So couple of characteristics of the RACF database. Uh, you can have an online backup. That's a good thing. So you have a primary RACF data set and a backup RACF data set. We'll see how that factors into the cisplexy nature of RACF. You can have a single RACF data set, right? Or you can have multiple RACF data sets comprising your RACF database. We call that a split RACF database. We'll see how that applies in the cisplex environment. RACF has its own very, very high performance data access mechanism. It doesn't use the normal data facility product kinds of things. We'll talk a little bit about that. And in particular, we'll talk about RACF's caching and how RACF stores information in storage so it can avoid trips out to the disk. Right? Performance is a very, very important uh, aspect of RACF. You know, it's not unusual for installations 
to be calling RACF functions thousands of times a second. So it's really important that we can squeeze every bit of performance that we can. And caching is a big part of that. And as a part of that, we have our own serialization mechanisms. You won't usually see sysdsn enqueues for the RACF data set. RACF does its own thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. So what's in the RACF database? Well, all those RACF configuration options that you set with setter ops, the set RACF options command, such as what classes are active, what classes are rack listed, what the logging options are for those classes, uh, your password rules, all that stuff, that's in the RACF database. And then of course, all the profiles, user group, data set, general resources, connections, all of that information also in the RACF database. Now, on top of that, there is an index structure so RACF can quickly find the profiles that are of interest. We'll talk a bit about that in just a moment. There's a lot of metadata in the RACF database. So all the definitions of all the fields and all of the profiles are part of what we call the RACF templates. And that's the thing we ask you to update periodically uh, when, when we introduce new fields into the RACF database, which we usually do every release and sometimes even in the service stream. Now, there's also control information in the RACF database. There's information that are counters that we use to help us manage our caches and some other things. And we'll, we'll spend a few moments talking about that in, 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 well, certainly within the next hour. Now, when RACF is looking at data in the RACF database, right, RACF considers everything and, and manages everything based on its RBA, its relative byte address. And the way to think of that is imagine RBA zero is at the very, very start of the data set. And every byte after that is a monotonically increasing integer. Oh, I love phrases like that. It's just a number, you know, RBA zero, RBA one, RBA two, you get the idea. Every byte is labeled, right? So those RBAs are how RACF addresses the stuff in the RACF database. Now there are certain RBAs in the RACF database that are uh, fixed by the architecture. I love that if you ever see uh, principles of operations, they talk about certain storage locations as fixed by the architecture. RACF has the same thing. So for example, RBA zero, it's the most important block in your RACF database. It's called the inventory control block or the ICB. We'll talk in a few minutes why that's such an important block. Then RBAs 1000 through 8000, that's the RACF database templates. Those numbers, by the way, are in hexadecimal. Any other piece of data in the RACF database can be absolutely anywhere. RACF basically says, where's the next free spot to put this? Okay, psh, it's over here. And that's the RBA that will be assigned to that profile. Uh, RACF manages these things with a something called the BAM, the byte allocation mask, which is our way of tracking uh, these, these RBAs. And whenever RACF allocates storage for a profile, it always does it in uh, 256 byte chunks, we sometimes call that a slot, uh, but IO is always done in 4K blocks, right? Uh, RACF always writes stuff to and from the RACF database in 4K chunks. And what that means is it's relatively straightforward for RACF to translate, should we ever need to do this, to translate from the RBA into a block number. You simply shift the RBA to the right by 12 bits, and boom, that's your block number. So it gives you a very convenient way. Should we ever need to do that? Uh, we'll talk a bit about how RACF does IO in just a moment. Now that thing that I call the inventory control block, the ICB, RBA zero, the most important one on the RACF database. Uh, the reason why it's so important, this is the place where those global system options are, are, are stored. So all those setter op options of what classes are active and things like that. We also use it as the anchor point for the indexing that we use for all of the data in the RACF database. So the RACF database has a tree-like index and the top point of that is a starting point, the top level index point. There's a pointer to that from the ICB. The other thing that's in the RACF database that's very relevant to the discussion over the next 50 minutes is there are counters in there. So when RACF updates something, you do a RACF administrative command to let's say change a profile, RACF updates a counter that says, hey, this data block, a data block has been changed, not this data block, a data block has been changed. And this way other systems, when they read the ICB, they have the counter from the last time they read the ICB, they read it now, they see there's a difference and they may have to take an action based on that. We'll talk about that as well in just a few moments. So let's talk about that rack of high level index structure. And the whole goal here is to go from a profile name 
into an RBA relative byte address so that we can then go from the RBA into a physical cylinder head record. So RACF, when it does IOs, it's doing EXCPVR, execute channel program. It's one of the lowest level interfaces for reading and writing data. We're literally saying, go to that device and read that cylinder, that head, that record. Right now, in the old days, old days, I'm not even sure what the old days are anymore, when we actually had spinning 3380 and 3390 devices, uh, a lot of the performance considerations were things like where are you putting the RACF data set on the volume and, and stuff like that. Nowadays, with virtualized disk drives, right, we really don't have a spinning 3380 or 3390 architecture. Everything else is, is emulated, right, but we, we're still using that interface. Read this record by its cylinder, head, and record. We use the index to take the profile name, go from a profile name, user Fred, to find what the RBA is of Fred, to then translate that into a cylinder head record so we can do IO for the purpose of reading and writing. And the ICB is the starting point of all this. The, start, the ICB is what points to the top level index block. And then we'll go through the index block. So let's say you're reading, you have a three level index structure and the number of levels will be dependent on how many profiles you have in your RACF database. Three is a typical number. We'll have to read the top level index block, the level three, which will point us to a level two block, which will point us to the level one block, sometimes called the sequence set. And from there, we'll get a pointer to the actual profile. So that's processing. As you can see, that's four possible IOs. Wouldn't it be nice if we could cache some of the stuff and not actually be reading and writing data? And the answer is yes, you can do that. You should be doing that. You probably already are doing that. And we'll get into more details about that. So as I mentioned, RACF does EXEPVR, execute channel programs. Uh, it is its own access manager. So that means, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have the SysDSN NQs. We have our own serialization mechanism, which is a combination of NQs, usually beginning with sys, uh, ra, sys Z or sys rack, uh, names of that, that, that variety, very, very dedicated to RACF, right? Or there's a bit in the ICB called the lock bit. And this is a bit that can be set by UT400 and by the RACF database unload utility, which if you set it, RACF will not allow updates to the RACF data set, but it will allow read activity. And the intent of that bit was if you're doing maintenance on the RACF database, uh, that bit will get set and, and, and no updates will occur that might uh, interfere with that maintenance. Now, one of the reasons why I bring this up is it's very important that if you're copying data, you're copying your RACF data set, you have to use a utility that honors and understands the RACF serialization mechanisms, right? That's UT200 and UT400. A lot of folks will use uh, IEB Jenner, ICE Jenner, other utilities, and it works great until it doesn't. It might work 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the time, but one time when you're making that copy, that unserialized copy, an update gets made and you don't have a good copy. So that's just my caution there. Use only the RACF utilities for copying a live RACF database. All Mark, right. We've yes. got a question. Yes. <clears throat> EXCP reads would be part of the reason you can't encrypt the RACF data sets. Is that right? So the question is, I'm going to make that a different question. Why, you know, what, what are the things we would have to do to encrypt the RACF data, data set, right? Yeah, one, one of the things is the access method, absolutely. The second thing is, in order to encrypt the RACF data set, there are certain facilities that need to be available very early in the IPL process, and they're not there yet. So there's at least two reasons. But, uh, you know, that's one of the highest priority things we've got our, we're thinking about and trying to figure out how to make work. Excellent question, whoever asked it. Other questions? Not at the moment. <laughs> Excellent, all right, let's move on. So as I mentioned, wouldn't it be nice if we could buffer information like these index blocks and the answer is you can. That's the purpose of those uh, to up to 255 in storage buffers. We call them resident data blocks, even though they can contain index blocks as well. And you can have up to 255 of them per RACF data set. So if you split the RACF data space three ways, you'll get three sets of those. You get to pick the number, zero to 255. 255 is the right number, in my opinion. Now, you, that information or that, that count of buffers is, is specified in the RACF data set names table, ICHR DSNT, or the since 23 the IRR PRM XX PARM lib or PARM lib members, Mr. Wilson would say, uh, 
I just want to point out that anytime I say you specify something in ICHR DSNT or IRR PRM XX, that means that you have to do an IPL. You have to push the blue IPL button, although it's not a button anymore and it's certainly not blue. You do have to perform an IPL. It does not have to be a cisplex wide IPL, right? Just a, a single rolling IPL is perfectly acceptable for almost all changes to the RACF data set names table. All right, uh, where do those buffers reside? They reside in key zero fetch protected common storage or in ECSA. Uh, if they're in CSA, it means probably you have a RACF exit that's running in 24 bit mode, not a good thing to do, right? Uh, we use a least recently used cast out algorithm. So we populate this and it gets populated very quickly. And then when we decide we're bringing something in, oh, look, we have a new piece of information. Oh, the, the cache is already full. Take the, the thing that's been referenced the least and get rid of it. And the new guy goes in there. Now, one of the challenges with this is each system sharing your RACF database, let's say it's shared three ways. Each system has its own set of buffers, right? Which means if another system changes a block in the RACF database, then there has to be a mechanism by which RACF will purge that information on all the systems sharing that RACF database. And that mechanism is the ICB and that mechanism are counters in the ICB. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. All right. Now, uh, who uses those in storage buffers? Any anytime RACF does IO to the database, whether it's by a request equals anything, request equals auth, request equals verify, request equals list, a chinti, which is the lowest level programming interface in the RACF database, or any of the RACF commands, setter ops, another example, all of them will be referencing the in storage cache because if it's a read operation and we can get information out of the cache, we don't have to go to the RACF database. And that's a good thing. Right? If we are making an update, well, we have to update our cache. We have to make the update in the database and then we have to update the counters. So any system that is sharing the RACF database will be aware of the change and can take the appropriate action. Uh, so everyone's using the buffers. They, they do get a lot of activity and pretty much anything that's doing anything in RACF will be using the buffers. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that the use of the buffers is serialized, right? So the RACF buffer uh, NQs that we put out uh, SISI rack F as an example, uh, SISI rack two is another example. Those NQs will be uh, wrapped around our access to the in storage buffers. So there's still some serialization potential impact uh, uh, even when we go to the buffers, but it's a lot better than if we went to the buffers, oh, the information wasn't there and now we have to go to the rack F database. So when you're sharing the RACF database between systems, I've sort of started this story. Uh, imagine you have two systems, system one, system two, sharing the RACF data set. Uh, well, it's a single RACF data set environment for simplicity. If you had multiple data sets, the same processing happens for each data set. Uh, RACF has a set of local buffers on each system up to 255, and as I said, 255 is the right number for that. Let's say that we have a case where, let's see, system one's got some information in the buffers. System two is now going to make an update to the RACF database. So system two knows about its buffers, right? So it makes whatever change it has to make there, right? And then it writes the change out to the RACF database and it writes and increments a counter in the RACF database. And that counter will represent uh, any of the RACF index levels, and I didn't say this earlier, but you can have up to nine uh, levels of index. I said three is what we normally see, three, four, five. You can have up to nine index level. There's another counter for data blocks. So let's say you add a profile in the RACF database. That's going to affect um, possibly multiple levels of index blocks and certainly will uh, update potentially a data block. So in that case, RACF will make the change to the RACF database. And since this change is happening on SIS2, the, the cache there will be updated and the counters in the RACF database will be incremented for the levels of index blocks, which were updated and for the data blocks, right? So those counters get updated. System one, one of the first things it's going to do before it does anything in RACF, almost anything in RACF, it's gonna read the ICB and it's gonna realize, oh, wait a second, the counters have changed. Right? The, ind the counter for the level one index block has changed. The counter for data blocks has changed. And at that point, it will go out and it will purge all of the blocks of that type. It'll purge all of the level one index blocks. It doesn't know which one changed. It knows some changed. 
when it will purge all of the data blocks from the cache on system one. Again, it doesn't know which one has changed. It knows just something has changed and the entirety of it has to get purged. All right, so that's how RACF's caching works. So I'll pause here. Any questions on that? As we'll see in data sharing, when we use the coupling facility, the rules change quite a bit. All right. So the bottom line, everything in the RACF database, read and written in 4K chunks. And we do it using a cylinder head record type of addressing mechanism. And we translate the RBA into that. Uh, when reading or writing those blocks, RACF performs its own serialization and it has a local cache of those blocks to avoid IO as much as it possibly can. All right, so that is, a, is the quickest overview I think I've ever done of the RACF database. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the what's and why's of a ZOS Sysplex. And one of the things I find is a challenge is that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different definitions of what these words mean. What is a Sysplex? Um, and I, I, these are my definitions. They work well for me. I took them out of some IBM documentation. So when we talk about a Sysplex, it's a tightly coupled cluster of independent systems, independent images. And in, in our world, we call each of those ZOS instances an image. Right? Tightly coupled, uh, it, unlike JES2, for example, which is loosely coupled, work gets put in, system pulls it off. When you have a Sysplex environment, the work uh, the systems are, are tightly, a little more tightly coupled. And we'll talk about what functions there are and how RACF uses them in just a moment. Now, those ZOS images within that Sysplex will communicate with other systems. That's, that's one of the core things is that in a Sysplex, systems are always talking to each other. And they'll communicate using either channel to channel or CTC connections, which have existed since System 360, or the cross coupling facility, cross system coupling facility, or XCS, a component of ZOS, which uses a different set of technologies that are the much higher speed types of technologies. Now, when you have a Sysplex, there has to be a definition of what that Sysplex is, specifically what members are in the Sysplex and, and other sorted information. That information gets stored in something called the Sysplex Couple Data Set or the CDS, right? The Couple Data Set, right? That's for the Sysplex definition itself, right? If you have applications which are using the Sysplex for a certain particular function, as RACF does, then you'll have some additional coupled data sets that are sometimes that are called function coupled data sets. Two separate concepts, or two separate instances, but the same general concept. It's information that's shared among systems so that the Sysplex can do the thing that it needs to do. Now, in addition, a, a key component of a Sysplex is a time reference, a consistent time reference. Right? We, some, some people just call it the Sysplex timer. I think the words that I've seen are Sysplex time reference, key component, right? You have to make sure all the systems have the same view of time. We move things forward uh, and uh, introduced on top of the base Sysplex, which actually came out, I think in the very early nineties in 1994, IBM introduced the concept of the coupling facility. And what the coupling facility does is it provides multiple ZOS images access to shared data. And I, I say data here, we'll talk in just a moment about what those, those things are, but it, it's a pretty unique uh, concept. and was very unique at the time. It was really like you had shared memory as well as some other stuff that you could have two disparate systems that had access to high speed memory, right? Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very controllable manner. Now, part of the technologies that came in was something called Sysplex Services for Data Sharing or XES, pronounced different ways in IBM. I'm not even gonna try that. And that provides a set of services to access data in the coupling facility and really, really importantly, to automatically notify applications that if they happen to have local copies of information, that data is no longer valid, All right? So that, that's one of, the, one of the key concepts that RACF exploits. Right, something called the vector, and we'll get to that in a moment. So what do these CFs provide? Uh, access to data, and by data, we mean one of three things. Lock structures, lock structures, which are used to provide serialization among, uh, among systems in that Sysplex. List structures, which are a, a ability to have a, a read-write mechanism for a list kind of, of data object. And then cache structures, which are shared caches. 
Shared caches or cache structures are the only thing that RACF directly takes advantage of. We don't have any lock structures. We don't have any list structures. We use only the cache structure facility of the CF and we use it as being a high performance cache that is on the other side of that, of that um, in storage buffer cache that I talked about. So why Sysplex? And for those of you who are able to attend Mark Anzani's session, he had some, uh, some really good observations, right? So the, the, one of the big driving points for IBM to come out with Sysplex technology was we were seeing a technology shift in the late 80s, early 90s. And the technology shift and technology challenge was that unit processors, single, single uh, machines were getting faster and faster. That's a good thing. But as they were getting faster and faster, the physics of what they were doing, they were using something called bipolar technology. Uh, bipolar is not a statement of the mental aspect of the mainframe. It's actually a statement of the kind of substrate, the kind of silicon that was actually used to create the integrated, surfix, sur uh, integrated circuits. Um, those are very, 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 very fast, right? That's, that's good. The downside is they produce a lot of heat. And the stat that Mark had uh, talked about in his session kind of astounded me. Each of those thermal conduction modules, which were roughly, I think they were about eight by eight, right, were generating 2.5 kilowatts, 2,500 watts worth of heat that needed to be dissipated. And as machines got faster, even more heat would have to be dissipated. So it was fairly clear that we had to find another technology. And this other technology, CMOS technology, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor, right, different type of substrate being used, uh, was slower. That's a disadvantage, but it ran much, much cooler. Right, and that was a huge advantage. We had to find a way to give folks the ability to do the kinds of processing they needed to do uh, on these CMOS types of environments. Right now, one of the challenges, and what actually one of the blessings of, of our platform is, is we understand the transactional nature of things. And the transactional nature of things is we have lots of requests that are relatively fast. We just have billions of them that we need to do. Did they need to be done all on one high speed heat generating monolith or could that work be spread across multiple systems? And the answer is it can be spread across multiple systems. And the parallel Sysplex was the way to do that, right? So you'd have less MIPS per machine, but you could aggregate together those MIPS in a way that could never have done before. And the challenge with aggregating systems together is if you have one system giving you X worth of, of processing power and you wart on the second system, you don't get two X, you get one point something X. Sometimes, you know, sometimes that, that the additional processor, you get much less than a full machine worth of stuff. And if you add a third on, the Delta goes down and down and down. The beauty of the parallel Sysplex is you don't see that. You see linear scaling. You got one machine, you put a second one on, you're not gonna get two, but you're gonna get one point something where the something is pretty high. When you put the three on, it's gonna be three point, you know, three times uh, and only a, a minor degradation to handle the fact that you have multiple systems which are now working together, right? So that's, that's the real reason why we came up with the Sysplex environment. But key in that is the assumption that if I have a piece of work that comes in to the system. It doesn't matter what system is chosen. You have up to 32 members of that Plex. You could go on system one or system 32 and you would get exactly the same answer. Now this is a little bit different from other architectures where you don't have to be necessarily as, as precise. So for example, if you are architecting, I don't know, a search engine, right? You might have search engine with its data of uh, reference data, right? And you might be able to tolerate the fact that if you went to one system, you got a slightly different answer than if you went to a different system. Now, the difference might not be in the first page or the second page of your search results. It might be in the 32nd page, might be in the third page, but it's going to be in there because the data can't be synchronized necessarily as tightly as one would like. That works great in that kind of application, but think about that. If you had a banking application and depending upon which system you went to, you got a different balance in your account, that would not give you warm fuzzies about that bank, that application, or that environment. So the beauty of the Sysplex is a single consistent view of data, including security data. 
So when RACF has access information, access rules in the RACF database, you have to get exactly the same answer whether you went to system one or to system 32. All right, so to me, that's the big architectural thing. And we're going to see in a moment how we do that in RACF. Uh, the other benefits, uh, workload balancing across images. So if you have work coming in, you can, you can direct the work to the least utilized system. And there's a lot of stuff in, in ZOS and in IBM Z to make that happen. Reduce software pricing. Uh, yeah, there are pricing models that will encourage you to go into a Sysplex. Uh, I understand that some people will do things that are somewhat unnatural to get pricing advantages, and we just have to recognize that happens and find ways of handling it. Uh, the ability to provide non-disruptive and scalable growth, though, I think is the other, other great characteristic of a Sysplex, right? You, but you build a Sysplex with N members, and now you need more N plus one. And you get almost all that benefit, not a lot of overhead. You don't have to do a lot of re-architecting of applications. That's a good thing. The second thing that's, that's key to this is that when you're looking at that Plex environment, if you need to take a system out because you're operating the, up, updating the operating system or you're doing a hardware upgrade, you don't lose the ability to run your application or your workload. You simply take that one system out of the Plex, do what you need to do, and then bring it back into the Plex. So total overall availability remains uh, the same. The system is not unavailable. The system is available, I should say it that way. My colleague, Mark Brooks was uh, doing a session and he showed us a, a command that one can issue that shows you when was the last time you IPL the entire Plex. And he was showing one of a client that had gone through multiple operating systems, upgrades had gone through multiple hardware upgrades and hadn't had a Plex wide IPL in 16 years. Sysplex and parallel Sysplex is, is very important to the, the concept of stability and 24 by seven availability. So uh, any questions on that as we go into the, uh, the media, the real reason why here, we're here to talk about RACF and the parallel Sysplex. Uh, there's nothing in the chat yet, Mark, but yeah, please uh, uh, feel free to drop questions into the chat. And like I say, we do have the, uh, option to uh, unmute as well and Aileen thank you for your uh, yeah, your thought there she says 16 years is impressive <laughs> it is it, yes. it, 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 I have to admit I think everybody in the room looked at that and smiled, <laughs> it, it smiled. <laughs> now I'll, I'll tell you that you know that happens because the installation was a large banking institution if I remember correctly has really good discipline Right, so you know, change activity—that's uh, an approved process. I mean, financial institutions tend to be a little on the cautious side. That's a great thing; we appreciate that. But what I'm saying is, with planning, you can make it happen. All right, so let's talk about how RACF uh, uses the Sysplex and the Sysplex technologies, uh, and there really is a stepping stone of processes. The the um, the top level is we go into use the coupling facility. We'll call, it's called data sharing mode. Uh, but you don't have to go to that level. There's a lot of stuff that RACF will do earlier. I right? don't have to go full data sharing. Uh, there are earlier steps in the migration to a parallel Sysplex that provides some, some, some real enhancements. So there are a couple of ways we do that. I remember I talked about something called XCF services, cross system facility for communicating, right? RACF will use XCF services so that we can better manage our ACEE DLF cache. Now, this is not the in-storage buffers that I mentioned a moment ago, 255 of them. This is a separate cache that RACF has um, for the purpose of storing ACEs. And, and the reason this came about, it came about in RACF 19 1990, is we were doing in that release a lot of security enhancements. That's where um, security labels came in, NJE controls, a whole, a whole bunch of JES enhancements came in. And we realized that if you were a simple example, you were a TSO user sitting there and you submitted a job, right? There were going to be a number of times RACF was called with something called a RAC route request equals verify, which is the service that one calls to build a security environment. And in fact, the simple act of submitting that job was gonna cause multiple of those to be submitted, all of which are identical, but would be submitted by different address spaces, right? So one from the initiator, um, one from the TSO session. So we saw a lot of activity. We figured what we should do is we should find a way of taking that AC when it's first created and then encapsulating it, putting it into an address neutral format. So basically take all the addresses out and replace them by offsets and stick that information into VLF, the virtual look aside facility. The idea being that the second time someone calls a rack route request equals verify for that user and some other stuff has to be the same like port of entry and, and some other stuff. 
We'll look in the VLF cache, and if it's there, we can inflate the ACE without having to go to the RACF data set, without having to do any I.O., without having to look in our in-storage buffers. Wouldn't that be a great thing? And it was. Uh, VLF caching, it's optional, but you know, go home and check and make sure you've got VLF caching enabled for ACEs. There are a couple of other objects as well that you can do it for, but ACEs is, is in my mind, the key one. Right? It worked great. Right? So suddenly we, we would no longer have to go to the RACF data set for this routine set of processing. Life is good, except when something changes. Right? So let's say you delete Fred. Right? Well, we have to go to the cache and do a Dell user Fred. We go to the ACE cache on that system. We pick all of the ACEs that represent Fred and we toss them away. That's great on the local system. On the remote system, what do we do? Well, we update a count in the ICB that says, oh, yeah, we, we just did something that affects the VLF cache. And on the other system, we get the, he reads the ICB and says, some ACE has been cached. I don't know which one. So it purges the entire VLF cache. And by the way, it's not just deleting a user, it's uh, changing certain access characteristics of Apple profiles, terminal profiles. We list all the things in the security administrator's guide that will, will cause a purging. Some of them will cause a purging of the entire cache on all systems. Some of them will do a very targeted one on the system on which the command is issued, the Dell user, but will do a global purge on the other systems. Once we're in a mode where we can use XCS XCF services, RACF says, any and all RACFs who are listening, Fred just got deleted. And then all those systems who are listening will pull Fred out of their ACE VLF caches and we don't have to purge the entirety of it. And it's all based on something we'll talk about in a moment called Sysplex Communications. Uh, as is the next item based on Sysplex Communications. To ensure in a consistent uh, view of the RACF data set, uh, we'll talk about that, and I think I have a chart on that. And then to communicate RACF administrative action, certain ones on for on other systems to communicate them a, around the sysplex. And then at the top of this hierarchy of things we do is the use of the coupling facility as an additional high-speed cross-system cache for RACF data. All right, the many modes of RACF. Uh, RACF doesn't have a term for when you're just using RACF without any of the coupling facility and sysplex stuff, stuff. So I'm just gonna call that base mode. This is the starting point. If you're running RACF and haven't done anything, this is the environment you're in. This is the starting point. And at this point, when RACF is doing IO to the RACF data set, it is going to be doing reserve release logic as opposed to a global NQ. Now, reserve release, I always think back to what this was like you know, the hardware equivalent of this. In the old days, it was actually a bit in the, uh, in the device itself that if you said reserve on this data set, it would flip a bit in that control unit on that device and no system could access that volume for any purpose. And when I say that volume, I do mean that volume. All data sets on that volume were now blocked for the time while you held the reserve. When you were done, you said release, and then other systems could access the data. While they were, while that was in the reserve state, any other system would wait until you were done. And again, in those days, one you could have multiple data sets completely unrelated, just the ones that happened to be on the volume uh, that would get blocked. That was, by the way, one of the reasons why we always recommended the RACF data set should be sh data set should be on its own volume. Right. So we use reserve release. Now I will point out that this is really the only environment that you should use if you're sharing your system outside of the GRS Plex. GRS is Global Resource Serialization. You link together your systems in your Sysplex and you say these systems will be sharing serialization. And if you're using reserve release, right, as opposed to NQDQ, we can share information with systems outside the GRS Plex. I don't recommend doing that. You could share VM systems. Um, you can share different. You can do lots of different sharing things, and I'm going to point out if that if the RACF scoping uh, serialization or the the scope of the RACF data set in terms of the systems that it includes is not the same as your GRS Plex. You got to be very, very, very careful, and if you're not very, very careful, uh, hilarity ensues or bad things can happen. Uh, Lenny uh, Demokratia today had a really good suggestion. He said that the scope of your your RACF data set should match the scope of your ICSF data set. And I agree wholeheartedly. It doesn't have to, but if it doesn't, you gotta be really, really careful. And if you don't get it right, hilarity ensues, as in prepare your resume.
right? So keep the scope, keep it simple. Scope of the RACF data set matches the scope of your GRS Plex, matches the scope of your ICSF Plex, and there are probably other things that we should have it match. All right, that's just, that's, that's where we are today. That's base RACF mode. That's you haven't done anything uh, to enable the more advanced things. So the first of these advanced things is some call, something called Sysplex communications mode. Sysplex communications mode, first thing, how do you enable it? You set something in ACHR DSNT, the rack of data set names table, or you set it in Parm Live. And remember, as I said earlier, if I say you're setting something in there, you, you have to IPL at least that system. So second thing, uh, if you're using uh, Sysplex communications, you have to have at least 50 resident data blocks, 50 of those local buffers defined. If you don't, RACF is simply going to allocate 50 for you anyway, put up a console message and move on and continue with the IPL. So just be aware, you should, you should have 255, but if you don't, we're going to make it at least 50. One of the things that happens when you're in Sysplex communications mode, and, and the purpose of Sysplex communication mode is it's a foundation for data sharing mode, which has the, the requirement that we have a single security view. What uh, Sysplex communications mode is going to do is assure that you have a consistent ICHR DSNT and RACF range table across the Plex. Uh, what that's going to mean is that it is going to go out and the first system that IPLs in data share in uh, Sysplex communications mode will use its DSNT, its data set names table and its range table. The next system that IPLs with uh, data in uh, Sysplex communications mode, right, it will, RACF will read the DSNT and then compare it to the first one. And if there are certain key things that are wrong, it'll say, hey, your data set names table has got some problems in it. I'm gonna go use the one, uh, the base one, right? The one from the first guy who IPL'd, right? So that's how we get that consistent view of security across the Plex. Uh, we have more precise ACE uh, uh, VLF deletion, talked about that a moment ago. Uh, enables RACF command propagation. I Definitely want to talk about that in a moment. Uh, we still use reserve release for IO serialization. We're still using reserve release in this environment. And I point that out uh, because when you move to data sharing mode, we, we don't. We use a, a finer grained serialization mechanism. And, and just a terminology thing, if you're not enabled for RACF data sharing, we call this non-data sharing mode. Right? This is where terminology gets a little bit confused. And I apologize for that. Right, so if you're in Sysplex communications mode, um, that in and of it by itself, uh, if you have the ability and to go into data sharing mode, or perhaps you're in data sharing mode, which I haven't talked about yet, and I promise I will, uh, or you've and you've come out of data sharing mode, we'll call this non-data sharing mode. Right, so just some terminology. All right, so let's move the terminology data sharing mode. Uh, Another thing that requires enablement in the RACF dataset names table or the uh, Parm Live member, IRFPRM0XX. Again, that requires an IPL. It requires, it builds on top of Sysplex communications. And at this point, we're gonna use the CF as a systems wide data cache. We also get rid of reserves for serialization. They're replaced with global NQs. And, and yes, you can convert reserves in the old, in, in, if you're not using in, uh, data sharing mode, you can convert reserves into global NQs with some, some Parm Live members uh, in GRS, right? Uh, but this RACF stops issuing the reserves. We do our shared serialization. Uh, and we now have the ability to delete RACF local cache entries right, individually. So it's no longer delete all the data blocks or delete all of the index blocks of level one. We can go in there and be very articulate and delete this particular index entry or this particular data block. Uh, and uh, you'll see the mechanism we do that uh, in, in just a moment. There's another mode, it's a recovery mode called read only mode. The assumption here is you are either in data sharing mode or you were trying to get into data sharing mode, right? So you either were in or in trying to get into it and something happened where RACF could not do that. So either the CF reported an error after you were in, in data sharing mode or you were trying to IPL into data sharing mode and, and you couldn't. So what happens there, you go into what's called read only mode. Read only mode is exactly as the name says. It says the RACF data set can be used for reading but we're not doing any updating because we can't trust the serialization. That's the primary reason. So how do you get into this mode? Again, RACF will go into this automatically if you have an IO error at either when we're trying to use the CF or during IPL time. No database updates. 
I, I was talking to my colleagues as I was preparing material for this, and, and they tell me that there are some cases where RACF, if, if it's a CF transient error, RACF will put yourself back into data sharing mode, and that's a great thing. Uh, but if not, uh, and you have to do something manual, you do the manual repair, and then you put yourself into, the, into data sharing mode with the rvary data share command. So the rvary command, RACF vary. It's used to control whether you know what data set is whether a particular RACF database or data set is active or inactive. It allows you to switch from your primary to your backup. It's also used to move you from data non-data sharing mode or read-only mode into data sharing mode. Uh, the caution here, uh, one of my testers insisted that I, that I put this in quite rightly. She was absolutely right. Uh, R vary no data share. If you were to do that while in read-only mode, takes everybody out of data sharing mode. That's probably not what you wanted to do. All right, those are the many modes. RACF, so I mentioned we use XCF to purge VLF entries. RACF has another notification facility called ENF. ENF is a completely different uh, MVS function that we use not to communicate to other RACFs, but to communicate to anybody who might be maintaining their own security cache. So the concept here is if you go out and delete a user or add a profile or do a setter ops rack list, RACF issues one of these ENF signals, event notification facility signals with a particular number and details in the ENF signal. So the other systems who are listening to that, again, not RACF environments, but other, other systems, perhaps at ZOS communication server, they use this, DB2 certainly uses this. Uh, they can use this facility to go out and do a better, more fine grained control on their caches. Uh, so just know this facility is there and uh, it really gives them the ability to, again, not purge an entire cache at one time, which is I think what DB2 was doing, but to be very, very granular in their, their deletion and their management of their caches, very similar to what RACF was doing with the VLF cache. Command propagation. Uh, again, we want to have a single view of security across the, the security environment. So to do that, several of the RACF commands, some of the rvary commands and the setter ops commands, and the setter ops commands are the ones that, that I think are the ones that are, uh, most people are, are familiar with. Uh, if you're taking doing the rvary command to activate and activate switch or to move into or out of data sharing mode, right? that information, if you issue it on a system in a RACF system, uh, we will share that information with other systems in that RACF data sharing group. Now I say data sharing group, that really means Sysplex communications. So if you're in Sysplex communications, all of the systems that have IPL with that will be in the same RACF data sharing group. Bad use of words, and I apologize for that, but you're in Sysplex communications mode. That, what that means, if you do an R very switch on one system, it happens on all the systems in that environment. If you do a setter ops rack list refresh, and that's the command that you will use. If you change a profile, it's a rack listed profile and you want it brought into storage, the setter ops rack list refresh on this system brings that into storage on this system. And then that command gets propagated to all of the other systems in that data sharing group. And the reason for that is you want to have a single view of security across that plex. That's a key component. It's really the reason why this, uh, this, this, this particular part of the design was implemented. Um, what this means, but, and I've seen this happen in, in, in folks who are not in Sysplex communications. What they would do is they've got five systems sharing the RACF database, right? And what they have is a process that says, if somebody goes out and rack lists it on this system, we're gonna rack list it on all the systems. Usually it's done with a batch job. So they have a process where a batch job is submitted on each system, let's say it five, it's five, to do this rack list refresh. That's great, works great. They go into data sharing mode, what happens? They go in, they submit the job to do the setter ops rack list refresh on each of those five systems. And the first system does it, and what happens? It gets propagated to all the other systems. And the second system does it, and it gets propagated to all those other systems, and, the, and you get the idea. So instead of having you know, five rack list refreshes done, one on each system, you get 25 done, all right? So if you're moving into Sysplex communication, just be, just be aware of that. Um, now, I, I will point out that uh, this is not the entirety. Not every setter ops command gets propagated. It's only these ones, rack list, rack list, refresh, no rack list. You can see the list there. Uh, but there are other things, like when you activate a class or uh, set generic on in a class or use the audit uh, log option, uh, audit options for a class, log options, 
all of those things are actually stored in the ICB. And those are propagated by each system reading the ICB and saying, oh, well, these are the options that are now in effect. Very cool. All right. Now, just some terminology you'll see in the RACF books. The, it's, it's kind of a two-phase commit, although not really. Uh, we call the system upon which the setter ops or very command is issued as the, uh, the uh, coordinator. So he will issue the command, make sure it works, and then he will propagate it to all the other systems and wait for them to respond. Once they've responded, yep, yep, we did it, yep, we did it, yep, we did it, then only then is control given back uh, to the person, right? So it's sent to, and as I said, it's sent to all the, C, all the systems who have IPL'd in the, in RACF Sysplex communications mode. All right, there was another point I wanted to make and I forgot what it was. Ah, it'll come back to me. Uh, let's see, now to the meat of the matter, using the CF as a cache. So we have these 256 buffers. The odds are your RACF database is way bigger than could fit in the in-storage buffers. So what we allow you to do is to define the coupling facilities, a high-speed stored cache that can be used by all the systems once you're in RACF data sharing mode. Again, how do you do this? ICHR DSNT, Parm Live requires an IPL. What size does that structure have to be? There is a minimum size and a maximum size. So the minimum size is the number of in-storage buffers you have times four plus one-tenth of that number times 4K, I said times 4, it's times 4K, times 4K times the number of systems in a sysplex, right? And there's a default for the backup structure or size for the backup structure. It's gonna be two tenths of whatever the primary size is. Forget the math, forget the math. CF sizer is the way to do this. So just go to that URL. Uh, you All that you have to plunk in there is the um, number of in storage buffers and the number of systems. Right, it'll give you a minimum size. All right, that's easy. Don't make it the minimum size, right? Make it as big as you can. How big can I make it? You can make it as big as the entirety of your RACF database. And I've seen a lot of customers do that. Working with a customer uh, relatively recently that had an astonishingly, a, 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 a huge amount of RACF activity going on, a huge amount of RACF activity going to the CF. And one of the CF reports, we could see that they were doing a huge amount of volume and the number of cast outs, zero. Right. Anytime RACF wanted to go into the CF, it found what it needed and life was good. So that, that's the thing to look at. All right, now how does this magic all work together? Uh, the thing is RACF has to make sure that we manage those in storage buffers uh, to up to 255, or again, 255 is the right number, along with the CF cache. All right, so let's imagine we have system one, it's writing some data into into the RACF database. The RACF database isn't shown here because I needed room for text. So we got the RACF database. We're gonna write some stuff in there. So it's gonna get written to the local cache, right? That's the little green boxes, All right? And it's gonna get written to the CF. And you notice there, there's a little thing called the local cache vector, right? That's, that's a CF term, right? What that is, is there's a, you can think of it as one bit per RACF block. And what it's going to do is it's going to know, it's gonna be notified by the CF if a particular block is no longer valid. So the idea here is anytime RACF goes to look at any piece of information in its local cache, it's gonna first look at that local cache vector, right? And if that bit is on that it says it's valid, life is good, we can use it. If that bit is not on, right? It says it's been updated, then we have to go to the CF to get the most current block. Right, so that's the logic. This, the local cache vector is kind of the secret sauce that makes this whole thing put together, right? So system one will only uh, will validate every index block it has against what's in the CF. And as I said earlier, the CF has some facilities to notify applications. Ixl vector, that's the function that we're talking about here. It will keep that local cache vector up to date. So if it says the block is valid, the block is valid. The block is not valid, we look in the CF. If it's there, great, we avoided IO. If it's not there, well, we have to read the RACF database to get the block, right? We put the block in the CF, we put the block in local in our local buffer, and we go on. Now, one of the things that happens when, when a write occurs, RACF always first writes to the data set, 
then it writes to the, uh, the CF and then it writes to its local buffer. And the reason why I point that out, that says if, if there's ever a question is what's right, let's, let's say that the, the, you know, in the remote and you know, unforeseen circumstance that there's some issue with the CF, not a problem. The RACF database has the most current information. And from that, uh, you can on-demand build the CF. So that, that's kind of how the magic all works. It's that, that vector, that local cache vector that keeps the RACF in storage buffers consistent. So it's such that, and when I say consistent, it means RACF can tell very, very quickly. And, and I think one of the most important things of this is the speed of all this happening. Uh, I mentioned that client that had a very, very uh, high CF and uh, activity environment. Uh, they were getting response time in the mid to low single digit microseconds as opposed to the milliseconds that you have to, uh, you'd encounter if you were going out to the RACF data set itself. So that's the reason why the CF is there, right? And that's the reason why we did all of this other stuff to make things act consistently. That's why we have the propagation of commands and, and, and all that other stuff. And, and things like the ENF notification, the ACE uh, purging, uh, more granular purging, those are all just sort of side benefits that came along. Uh, this, the thing I love about the Sysplex environment is you got to do some homework to make it work, but once you do, its performance is a screamer. We've uh, got uh, another question, yes. Mark. Yes. <clears throat> What's the rationale for defining the RACF structure as big as possible, as you've recommended? Oh. If, we were, if we were limited to 255x4k buffers, uh, x number of systems. Superb question. The, the rationale is because IO is three orders of magnitude slower, roughly. So by defining the CF structure larger, you increase the probability that any data block that you want is in there, right? And you increase the probability of not having to do IO to the RACF data set. And that has just benefits out the wazoo. Now, you know, one of my colleagues likes to say as a developer, we tend to think of all software is free and all hardware is unlimited. We know that's not true. And you might have to not allocate it the entire size of your RACF database. That's okay. The right size though will depend upon the amount of access you're doing and more importantly, the frequency of, of the types of access, the locations that you're accessing in the RACF database. All the information in the CF is organized in exactly the same way in, in, in the sense that it's all by RBAs. So if you know what, how many RBAs you had uh, that were accessed frequently enough that you wanna put them in the CF, that's the number of additional blocks. That's the other. That's what I was thinking. The other thing you can put in the CF sizer is not just uh, the number of systems, but the number of additional blocks that you want to put there. If you can't put the entire size of your RACF database, you should put a number in there that's better than 255, right? Because the more you can allocate to this, uh, potentially the better your performance are. But you know, all performance numbers are relative to workload. So, boy, good question, and, and it reminded me of the other point. So, thank you. Other questions? Well, then let me just finish up with uh, something that I think was one of the most popular things we did in, in 2.3. Uh, I didn't realize how popular it was, mostly because I like writing assembler and nobody else does. Uh, so you used to have to code the RACF dataset names table and the RACF range table in, in assembler. Then you have to link edit them and you do, do all that, put them in the right place. Uh, and then IPL, well, we've simplified that. You still have to IPL. Right? I can't get away from that. But instead of doing that, you can specify the content of your data set names table and your range table in ParmLib in a syntax that I think most systems programmers are familiar with. Uh, there's really nothing exciting here uh, other than, oh, it's so much easier. And as much as I like running assembler, I really like the ability to change my RACF environment very quickly for testing purposes. So that takes us to the end and thank you very much. Please do the feedback. Uh, they really appreciate that. I know the GSE folks really appreciate it. Uh, I hope to get invited back again. That would be nice. And yeah, I, I really, GSE is the only conference I know that does this is that, you know, we used to have the ability for speakers to say, no, don't give me the pen set, give the money to a, to a good charity. I love the charities you pick and yeah, please support them. Oh, so thank, thank you, you Mark. Thank you so much. And of course, we'll have you back. And uh, just as an FYI, we do have Mark on more security sessions um, coming up. And also, he's doing a keynote today at five o'clock. That's five o'clock GMT, which is mainframes in the moon. So some of us heard that last year. Mark come, came and did that at the, at the security stream uh, on the conference there, didn't you, Mark? And we also uh, 
had a little private session, I think, in the <laughs> evening with a few of us with drinks and uh, and uh, and snacks and things. So definitely join us if you can for that. But yeah, thank you. Um, Aileen says, yeah, the best thing I learned at GSE one year was the IRR PRM yeah, uh, change in 2.3. That's, uh, that's excellent. Um, so uh, and uh, and Kira says, yeah, we can't wait to see you again next year as well, <laughs> as well as your I lovely wife, Julie. <laughs> We can't wait to be back. We this it really is the highlight of our year to do a week of vacation and 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 drink good beer. <laughs> yes, and and Henry says I'll bring the beverages to the moon session. <laughs> <laughs> so no, look, we'll look, we'll see, we'll see you again at five o'clock, Mark. Thank you so much. So yeah, this is se okay. session six AI. Don't forget to leave your feedback. Uh, use the QR code um, or uh, go directly to the agenda. Click on Mark session and uh, scroll down and you'll see the right at the bottom, the link to, to give feedback. Like I said earlier on, it's very important for not only for the presenters, but also for GSE, but also if you wanna get your CPE or CPD certificate to you know, to collect your number of CPE hours, that, that's all based on the feedback uh, that you actually give. So, uh, so please do do that. We haven't ended the conference by all means today. Like I said, there's a few more sessions to go. So we're going to take a, a, a 30 minute break now. And um, the next session starts at three o'clock GMT. Um, if there's a few technical sessions going on, by the way, at three, but if you want a more of a soft skills uh, session, uh, non-technical, there's a session with Glenn Anderson, which is the title of, yes, and how to and how collaboration energizes your team's performance. So that sounds quite interesting. It's one I might attend. And then if you're new to Zed on the 101 stream at four o'clock, there's a, there's a session there that might be for you. But yeah, essentially Mark's back at five o'clock um, today to do his mainframes in the moon session. Tomorrow, um, the first security session of the day starts at midday um, with uh, with Henry, um, and uh, he's going to be talking about mainframes and malware. So join us if you can for that. But again, essentially the conference starts at nine o'clock tomorrow morning with all of the other sessions. So lots of great content coming up um, over the next few days. So uh, please do uh, join us for those if you can. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. And Mark, once again, thank you for an excellent presentation. Pleasure to have you back again. Great See to you be later here. on. Okay, thanks everyone.